Welcome back to TSG Live Crew Lounge. What we were doing before was we would hold the crew lounge locally and have a bunch of people live at the Santa Clara Depot. And thanks to COVID, we can't do that right now. So I've invited some friends and people that I regard as well well informed or people who know what they're talking about to join us here today. And our topic is going to be how the pandemic ha pandemic has affected your model railroading or what you've been doing to, to, I guess, cope with the pandemic. And I've got uh, four people waiting to join me and I, I'll bring them in one at a time and they'll introduce themselves, who they are, where they're from, that kind of thing. And then we'll get our discussion started in earnest at that once the last person has joined and then you're free to ask questions in our live chat screen on the left side of your screen and i think that should set us up for what we're doing here so let's bring in our first guest and this is james regeer welcome james hi everybody and uh yeah i'm i'm from st louis um, I don't have much of a layout, but I have, uh, I have really, uh, taken a lot of, uh, joy in trying to, you know, mess with old locomotives and try and light them up, detail them and, uh, make them do all sorts of fun stuff, stuff with LEDs. Um, so that's been a lot of fun. And over the past year, year and a half or so, I've been, uh, I've been, uh, participating on Ken Patterson's What's Neat This Week. Um, doing a bunch of segments there, um, as well as his uh, as well as his monthly show with Model Railroad Hobbyist Magazine. Right, a regular contributor. Very good. Yeah. All right, so let's bring in my friend Seth Newman next. Welcome, Hi. Seth. <clears throat> How you doing, John? Uh, let's see. Uh, I live in Mountain View, California. I modeled the Union Pacific in uh, San Francisco Bay Area in 1999. I'm primarily an operator, although I was president of the layout design SIG for a while, uh, also very active in the operations SIG. So I'm mostly about operating and promoting operations, and I have a little business called uh, Model Railroad Control Systems that makes uh, electronics for model railroad operations. So all kinds of cool things to support signaling, uh, train order operation, all kinds of stuff like that. Very good. Thanks, Seth. And let's bring in our other friend, Bernard Beck. Welcome, Bernard. Hello, John. How are you? Uh, my name is Bernard Beck. Um, I'm modeling uh, Germany. As you can see, I'm sitting in the middle of my layout here. Uh, we are in the middle of the Black Forest uh, in the early 70s. And I'm very much into operations, and I'm uh, trying to make this work uh, on a small layout, which um, it's an interesting challenge at times. Um, I'm also a member and currently a president at Silicon Valley Lines uh, in San Jose, uh, a large club layout with lots and lots of uh, operations. Um, and um, I think, yeah, John, John made a few videos uh, at Silicon Valley Lines over the uh, uh, last couple of years. So, and, and there's one coming out next week, which I'm sure we'll talk about sometime during this. <laughs> But yeah, yep. thanks for joining us, Bernard. And now I'm going to bring in James Brasil, who's another friend involved with Silicon Valley Lines. Uh, just a heads up, James is having a little bit of uh, technical difficulties with his connection for various reasons, but we're going to do our best to include him here. So let's bring him on. Hello, James. Hi, my name is James Brasil, and I hope that you can hear me properly. My uh internet connection is not going so well today so i'm on my phone and uh this is the first time i'm trying it so far uh, john hasn't said that it's not working so i'm just going to continue uh my name is james brasler and i am a member of silicon valley lines with bernard at uh in san jose california and i am currently in a hotel in half moon bay not on my normal internet and i don't have any of my normal train stuff here otherwise i'd probably be sitting like in front of my layout uh it's just another small layout not really focused on 
operations per se, but uh, we've done one operating session on there and it ended up working out pretty well. Very good. Well, we're supposed to have one more person here today, but he hasn't showed up yet. If he does show up at some point during the proceedings, we'll bring him in and make him feel guilty for not being here on time. So as long as we all agree with that. <laughs> So I'm going to change the uh, format of our screen here and go to this one. Oh, it didn't change. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, there we go. Oh, hey, hey, all right. Now, right now we're. <laughs> so what I'd like to do then is we'll we'll kind of go. I'm going to try to take myself out of the conversation as, as much as possible. But if I have something to add, I will from time to time. But our topic today really is about how the pandemic has affected your modeling or your ability to do what you like to do to enjoy the hobby. And uh, yeah, whoever wants to go first, just get started talking and I'll make you big on the screen. Oh, I thought I heard you breathing, Bernard. That makes you first. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So... The, back in March, when uh, the Bay Area basically shut down with, uh, with the pandemic uh, coronavirus shelter in place um, experience, um, I earned two and a half hours each day because I didn't have to commute anymore. Um, I'm very, and I switched to work from home. My employer uh, lets me do that. It actually works reasonably well. But um, I normally spend two and a half hours each day um, on the freeway, going to the office, coming back from the office. And I realized, oh my God, that is awesome. I have two and a half extra hours per day to do stuff. So I very, very conveniently used one hour of that to sleep in in the morning. Um, and actually got quite a uh, used the other hour-ish um, um, to spend on, uh, on modeling stuff and um, um, work on projects that I, that I had uh, on the workbench anyways. Um, and this was all with the expectation that, well, it's March, I have a show planned that I want to attend uh, in July, so um, I should get my module that I want to show there really ready so that it's presentable. So I actually spent quite a bit of time on this. And fast forward uh, a couple months, uh, it became clear that, yeah, this COVID thing is actually not over so quickly. And it's turning more into a marathon than a sprint. And um, I noticed that as I realized that um, my, my modeling time felt much, it turned more into a, uh, it, it felt more like work because suddenly I was spending a lot of time on virtual events. I was doing less modeling because hey, there's stuff that I'm doing, but I want to show off the things that I'm building. I want to show it to friends that are visiting. I want to uh, show it at a show or whatever. And there is none of that in the near future. So um, I actually ended up um, doing more presentations. I spent more time on uh, virtual events like this one. Um, and um, I realized that that's what I do at work as well. I'm writing presentations. I'm spending time uh, in video conferences. Ah, rats, my, my modeling time feels like work. That's not good. I need to do something. And so the last uh, couple of months, I uh, spent I, I very consciously uh, tried to spend more time on doing things not with a computer. So get away from all these cool offerings that are out there. Um, we can do that some other time, but I, I need to do something with my hands. I don't want to sit uh, in front of my computer all the time. So I did. <laughs> no, that, that makes a lot of sense. So you got a lot more, you got a lot more time. So you were able to do things you weren't normally able to do. So, and you know, I, I was thinking about that 
when when I thought of this topic in the first place, I thought there there kind of are two things because I also like to work on models just doing DCC installs and I've been kind of tinkering around with weathering. And but I also like to operate, as you know, Bernard, because I've been to Silicon Valley Lines a number of times to operate. And the pandemic really put a block on that, the operations. Yep. Yep. But I think that we're all finding more time to do the stuff that we would do at our workbench. So that's kind of was the two ideas that I had, but I wasn't thinking in terms of having to do more presentations for your for your online modeling groups, right? And that's something else that we've been doing a lot of. Um, I think, Seth, you could probably talk to that because you've been presenting at the PCR Zoom meetings and stuff like that. Uh, what have you found to be the most challenging part of what's going on now? Well, I, I think you're, you're quite right. I mean, we, you know, we kind of have a social life around uh, operating and uh, a couple of different lunch groups. Now, one of them we've been able to move online. Uh, John also participates in that. Um, and you know we've had to make do with um you know less contact uh now you know some of us like bernard's involved in a group that's really been working very hard at trying to do uh remote operations and uh you know i think that's great although it's it's certainly not you know getting together at the layout with a bunch of your friends but it, it does give you something and that's what they've been able to achieve is really I wouldn't have really thought it was quite possible, you know, before the pandemic and, you know, yet they're doing it. So that's great. You know, what that leaves is, uh, you know, I've been catching up on some things I wanted to do on my own layout more in terms of modeling. Um, and there's some interesting thoughts about that we can maybe get into later. And also I have a small business model, uh, railroad control systems. And, uh, one of the interesting things here is that, uh, uh, basically, my customers all went nuts, got to work in their basement, uh, uh, need a lot of technical support, you know, because model railroaders never buy stuff when it's available and throw another the layout thing, they'll get back to it. Um, well, they all yeah, have- that, does, that doesn't happen at all, Seth. No, that, that's never happened. Um, I don't have any. I have so many kit boxes down there that I'm pretty sure they've been breeding uh, in the dark <laughs> under the layout. Um, uh so I've been able to do some of those, but mostly I've been trying to be responsive to customers and we've got, you know, a bunch of really interesting projects going on. And uh, I did get to do a little work on the telephone product line uh, just in time for everybody to not want to have people come down in the layout and touch a bunch of stuff that needs to get sanitized. So that inspired me to get my Y throttle server working. And there were a whole bunch of interesting things about that. But I think, you know, as we come out of this, that might be a real big deal because uh, you only have to touch your own phone, which is covered with your germs anyway. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, you know, just a lot of ways we haven't had to think about uh, model railroading and operating will be, be there going forward. Yeah, for sure. Uh Oh, this is interesting. Somebody is already asking about the camera cars, you guys. <laughs> uh, oh. here, yeah, here's the thing. Oh, yeah. uh, here's the deal. So there are a number of TSG train crew members in the viewing audience right now. And they've had a – this is going to sound weird. Some of you guys know this. So the TSG train crew are the people that are supporters on Patreon. And all the supporters on Patreon have had a sneak preview of the Model Railroading 101 episode that's coming out uh, this coming Saturday. And this is actually a very good question because I know that James actually down here built one of those camera cars. That's what someone wants to know. They want to they want to know about the camera cars. So uh, maybe we can put that in our back pocket. Or, or does one of you guys or do one of you guys want to talk about that now? Uh, James, you want to, since you were, you designed the one that was in the locomotive, didn't you? I did. So uh, if you go to our website, siliconvalleylines.com, you'll see it's probably like the second or third post down. Uh, it covers our remote off session cameras that we've kind of come up with. They use MJPEG streamer and Raspberry Pis, and usually they go on a flat car or something like that. But I decided that since it was small enough, 
I would shove one in the front of a dummy locomotive and it ended up working out pretty well. Um, the view of it isn't the greatest out of the front. So I suggest if you're going to do anything where the camera sits way out towards the front of the locomotive or the front of the car, you use a wide angle lens. Uh, and the other issue that we run into is battery life isn't so great since most of the uh, shells that we're using are uh, skinny hoods like the GEs and the SD units and whatnot. So maybe if anybody's going to try it, Maybe try and find a F unit dummy. Uh, uh, sorry, tripping over my words here. An F unit dummy engine mm -hmm. to stuff everything into with a big battery, so you can get more than a half hour, forty five minutes of stream time out of it. Right. What what right. voltage input do, do those cameras take? What was that? What voltage input do those cameras take? They take, what's it, I think 3.7 volts or something like that. You can run them off quite a broad spectrum of voltage. They use a juice box zero. And actually, Bernard has one right there in front of him. Um, let me, I didn't let me look at the exact specs. Let the camera, what, what I have here. Um, so this is, don't don't worry about the flat car underneath. That's a German prototype. Um, or not quite prototypical, actually, but whatever. It's an old flat car that I'm using for the, uh, uh, for this. Um, this is one of the, a camera that, uh, that I built. Um, it's mounted on a uh, styrene sled. And let's see. Let me see if I can get this to the camera real reasonably well. No, it doesn't quite work. OK, anyways, down here, uh, that's a regular um, Raspberry Pi Zero. Uh, and the 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 hat that sits on top of it is um, a, um, what is it called, uh, charging board? Juice Box Zero. No, Juice, Juice Box Zero. Mm -hmm. Thank you, James. Um, we use the Juice Box Zero to um, attach a lithium ion battery. Um, Dave will remind me that this battery needs to be into in an enclosure, and he's right. This is a naked lithium-ion battery. They really should be in an enclosure. Uh, those things can, uh, produce 3.7 volts. Um, that goes in here. And up in the front, um, I have uh, mounted a, a, a Pi Zero uh, spy camera. Um, it's it's not the greatest camera in the world, but uh, it, it gets the job done. Um, the camera could run off track power. Uh, the problem with track power is that it needs to be really stable. So some kind of conditioning of the power that comes in um, needs to be done. Otherwise, the, the Pi runs the risk of uh, rebooting. Um, I find it a lot easier to be completely off, uh, off the track power and have a battery on it. Um, that in that ca case, I can also take the camera car from one train, lift it up, put it in front of another train, and then the engineer can go again. If this were on track power, <clears throat> the uh, the camera has to boot again, uh, reconnect, uh, and then and then you can take off. So using the battery is a lot easier to handle. Um, Aside from that, this this is fairly straightforward. Uh, and as mm. as James described, um, we have a standard uh, Raspbian uh, OS uh, on, on the Raspberry Pi. We add uh, MJPEG Streamer with uh, the Raspberry Pi extensions, um, and just fire that up, and uh, that's all there is. Um, so once once that's running, you can open a web browser, um, open a stream. Um, from the camera that is logged into the Wi-Fi network, connect to the web browser directly, and can just watch the thing uh, move. And then once you are that far, um, you can go further. You can feed this uh, this video stream uh, into OBS. Well, that's an open broadcast uh, uh, system um, that allows you to do all kinds of fancy stuff, arranging video streams, combining video streams, whatever. Um, and uh, feed it through a virtual camera plugin into a video conference, and then have it uh, stream out to uh, to your remote operators. And uh, 
they can see what the uh, train is seeing or what the engineer in a cab would be seeing um, up front. Would someone's, you be asking, to someone's asking about backup cameras. I think I know the answer to that, but you guys could certainly talk about that. Yeah, of course you can have a ca backup camera. You just uh, need two cameras uh, on the board. Um, and a lot more bandwidth, as we learned. Right. Yeah. So, so I'm I'm not I'm not sure uh, actually. Um, so, is is a back backup camera in the sense in the sense of what's built into a car? Because um, I've I've seen that done as well. Um, those things tend to be really bulky. Um, uh, this here fits into the HO loading gauge. Uh, most of the cameras that, that are built into cars don't. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure if that's what he meant by that, but maybe that is what he was talking about, the backup cameras out of a car, huh? Yeah, I think maybe they buy those as, uh, you know, add-on kits. Uh, a lot of people use them for monitoring hidden staging yards and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're great for that. Uh, it's just they're... They don't fit on, the, on, on an HO car that well. Yeah, I'm going to have to learn some more about that stuff because I know I've uh, I know I've done sort of camera cars before, though not for live streaming. Um, sort of for uh, sort of more of the kind of uh, record to uh, uh, record that little SD or micro SD card. And uh, what I one idea I had that I haven't quite uh, haven't quite worked out yet was to mount that little camera into an old Bachman full-length dome car, so mm. that it'd be like you're a passenger just kind of riding along, and just getting that angle right so that it looks like it look it's looking out the front of the uh, in front of that vista dome at the uh, roofs of the cars in front of it. I, I I think that would be so awesome if I could achieve that, but I haven't uh, I haven't quite. I haven't quite done it yet, and it's it's sitting in a box on my on my desk with a few other uh, projects that I haven't quite uh, worked out yet. Yeah, looking. So this was one of the ideas we were uh, toying with uh, as well. It's like when uh, when you have a camera and you look over the roofs of the train that is ahead of you, you kind of get the the passenger view or the view of the conductor in the caboose. Um, that would be super cool. Um, in our case, <laughs> one problem we have with the remote operators uh, is that when, you own, when you're running a train remotely and you only have the view out to the front of the track, uh, you have the engineer's view, and that's great. Uh, you see signals, you see the track, you, you go through the tunnels, you go through the bridges, or, um, but you don't know if part of your train uncoupled or something derailed way behind you. Um, sure. So having a second camera on the train that is right in front of, or right behind the caboose or in front of the caboose um, so that you have a conductor, on, a remote conductor on the train observing what the train is doing, that would be interesting. Yeah. I, I love that. Um, we're, we're currently, uh, we've run up to four cameras uh, over Wi-Fi at the same time. Um, so far, um, the, the the bandwidth of the camera on, on the Wi-Fi is not really that much a limiting factor. Uh, the limiting limiting factor is much more the um, uplink bandwidth of uh, the internet um, connection that you have. Like at the club, it's really really sad. Yes. <laughs> That, that kind of ties into this other question that somebody's asking, which is embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> we, we live in Silicon Valley where all this high tech, you know, stuff takes place. And the, the best we can get or the best you can get at Silicon Valley lines is what you have, right? I mean, without spending a lot more. So, so yeah, um, yeah. So there, there are two aspects to that. Uh, one aspect is um, what what internet providers actually are willing to serve your building. Um, we are in a warehouse. Um, that's always a little bit interesting. And uh, the other part is how much are you willing to spend um, for your internet um, for a function that you're using a couple hours per month at most. And 
uh, we can uh, we can double our spend and get uh, a whopping 10 megabit uplink. Like, Ooh, 10 megabits. Um, <laughs> but it's double the price of what we're paying right now. And uh, we have not made that move yet. It's an option that we can do. If the membership wants to do that, uh, we can. Um, at the moment, we have not gone that, gone that route yet. Right. <laughs> I'm making the picture bigger so anybody can talk here. Keep the questions coming in, by the way. We, we have uh, quite a few viewers right now. So uh, I wanted to ask James uh, Regeer, because uh, you're into operations too, right? I mean, how has yeah. the pandemic affected your ability to operate? And what have you done about that to sort of cope? Well, so, so yeah, I was uh, operating uh, just about weekly there, uh, you know, going, going into March. And that in fact, uh, the week that uh, they shut things down, we had an operating session that Tuesday, and that was that's the last one we've uh, that's the last one we've been at. And there was, you know, that week before the the pandemic, there was sort of this ominous feeling in the air that you know something something awful was approaching, and and that's yeah, that's come to pass, and we haven't we haven't uh, gotten together since. Now, uh, some of the local restrictions, you know, depending if you're in St. Louis City or St. Louis County um, or outside of St. Louis County, um, the, you know, the restrictions vary by where you are. But for the most part, folks are still not eager to have other folks in their home. Um, so um, operating sessions are off for the time being. So, yeah, I've basically gone to my workbench and I've worked on, on, on uh, different projects. Uh, this GP, uh, figuring out my director here behind me, this GP60M over here uh, was a project that I did uh, sort of March to April. Um, there's a track mobile floating around here somewhere that I didn't get up on on the uh, on the bench work here um, that I recently completed for James Wright. Uh, that was a long-term project. Um, so various various other things uh, keeping me on my workbench. Of course, one of the one of the problems with that too is that we have two uh, two kids, uh, you know, a two year old and a five year old, and so that's an all hands on deck at all times job. And so, you know, that did just because we're we're in pandemic mode did not mean I got to spend a whole lot more time on the layout. And in fact, the hours got even later than they would have otherwise been. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's been a challenge certainly. And I have missed the operating sessions. Um, they'll come back eventually. I know that, uh, I, I know that I've been able to uh, go over to Ken's to do some running, uh, now and then. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's been pretty nice. And uh, the Magic House, where I've worked taking care of the layout, um, recently opened at 10% capacity uh, starting in uh, July. So I've been, I've been, you know, uh, been working there, running, uh, running some of my uh, locomotives while I do it, you know, cleaning the tracks and that kind of thing. Um, so there are definite, definite ways getting around it. Yeah, for sure. You know, you, you brought up something that I, I find interesting and it kind of ties in with something that I've talked about here on the channel and I think that uh, Seth kind of touched on it a few minutes ago which was we're having a lot more virtual meetings I mean normally the PCR that's our region for the NMRA that we belong to I think at least two of us on here on the call belong to the, the regional NMRA uh, we'd have uh, you know once a, once a month I think there's a meeting uh, there's a, a meet. What is it, Seth? Every every six weeks or every twelve weeks or something like that. Well, it was quarterly for the you know the in person meet like at the Boy Scouts or the yeah. Elks. Yeah. Yeah, those were once a quarter. I mean, now the PCR is meeting on Zoom like twice a month, so we're getting to see each other on our computer screens a lot more often, and actually getting to exchange a lot more ideas in that large group setting far more often than we would have otherwise. Uh, so, I mean, in a way, the pandemic has has brought people, well, I was going to say brought them closer together, but, you know, not physically, but just in the meeting of the mind sense. 
And I think that's kind of a, a cool thing. I mean, just the fact that we're able to do our crew lounge virtually like this bring, and bring people in from wherever. I mean, theoretically, we could have somebody here from, you know, from overseas participating. Well, you know, that's a that's a really good point. And another interesting thing that happens, uh, John, is, you know, normally we go to the local meet and 60, 70 people show up and uh, we divide up into little lots of folks who generally know each other anyway. Um, <clears throat> because there's really only one conversation going on at a time in the PCR Zoom, uh, we get to hear from people we don't always talk to. And that's been really interesting. And I've gotten to know some folks who, uh, you know, they're not in the regular operating circuit. And therefore, you know, I know them. I know they're model railroaders and enough to say hi to, but uh, really didn't have much of a sense of what they were about in the hobby. And uh, so that's a kind of a nice feature, isn't it? I think so. Because mm -hmm. I, I, there are people, for example, that I know who they are, and I've seen them at various places, but never got to introduce myself face to face. And now I've met them, at what I call e-meeting, right? Mm -hmm. Meeting them on an online setting like that. And I think that's pretty cool because now the next time when I see them in person, like, oh, hey, Mike, how are you doing? You know, or whoever it is. And we'll know, we'll know who, who each other are or is, whatever. You know what I mean? We'll know each other from talking online. So I think that is pretty cool. Do you, do you have anything like that going on where you live, James, uh, Rigier? Oh, ab absolutely. Um, so I, I have noticed that, that, you know, we're better able to make contact with folks that are out of town, you know, because of all these, because of Zoom and all these different technologies that have developed um, sort of uh, surrounding the needs of the pandemic. Um, and I've noticed that also, you know, in, in uh, doing uh, Ken Patterson's show, now, at first, there were some major adjustments, taking the entire panel from the table, you know, and, and putting them and putting them into a Skype meeting or a Zoom meeting and, and you know, helping helping Ken get around some of those technological barriers, um, you know, took uh, took some doing. Um, but uh, once once that was accomplished, I mean, suddenly we're able to, you know, talk to people all over the country on Skype as if they're guests right in Ken's studio. Um, so that's, that's been sort of a, sort of a treat. Now I've been trying to, <clears throat> excuse me, I've been trying to, you know, uh, take advantage of this on a more international terms. Um, I know that Ken, uh, Ken was a guest on Jennifer Kirk's uh, model railroading show in, in, uh, in Great Britain, um, which was fun. Um, but we haven't really made it uh, made it quite international as that. I, I, I know it would have been a uh, it would be a real treat to talk to the folks from uh, Minentor Wunderland at some point in Hamburg. Um, that would be sort of the sort of the holy grail in some in some points because there's a lot of the stuff that I do uh, with LEDs and those sort of, the sort of electronic animation that I try on my on my uh, you know with some of my projects that's directly inspired by that layout and just just sort of the amazing uh, things that they're able to accomplish on there. We haven't accomplished that yet, uh, you know, such a uh, such a high caliber interview, but the number of people that we're able to talk to on a regular basis has been pretty impressive. So, and related to that, uh, when you look at the NMRAX uh, presentations uh, that have been going on, uh, they routinely had presenters from Australia and uh, and Europe uh, on the schedule as well, which which is really really cool. Since um, on national on like the the regular conventions, you don't see that as much. Yep. Recently, I was involved with a meeting that had that was on the TSG Multimedia Channel, or it will be, that had people from Great Britain, Australia, Canada, and US all together, which I thought was pretty cool. I mean, you have to deal with time zones. And in that case, uh, some of the people had to be up very late or very early, depending how you look at it. But I think it's really cool to to bring people from different parts of the world together. Uh, that's something that we didn't really do before the pandemic. So there's another question that popped up on our chat that I highlighted here, if anybody wants to take that one. I'll answer that one a little bit, at least from my point of view. Uh, my layout is all of 12 feet long, so uh, it's more interesting operating with other people than by myself. However, uh, 
we I finally operated it with other people remotely during the pandemic before we started to get our club uh, layout operational remotely. So yeah, I can operate it without other people. They, it becomes a little bit more difficult to operate with other people, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not fun. I definitely had a blast during the time that we operated that. And I had to learn how to operate it myself for that meeting because it was more of just me learning to model than anything else. So I can say that, yeah, we can operate it without other people, but it definitely makes it better. The, the other thing we did early uh, uh, during the shutdowns uh, is like, uh, as, as James is saying, we, we had club members operate remotely on, on his layout. The way we did that is that James was pointing his webcam at a layout. And then as a group exercise, all the, the members who are at home are, are playing the role of the conductor and tell James, OK, now move your locomotive pass that switch over there, uh, then back up, get that first car, uh, put that aside, get the second car out that we want, put the first car back. Um, so the the group as a conductor is giving the engineer who's standing or sitting at the layout uh, instructions um, what to do, um, which is really interesting for the engineer who is doing it since they know exactly what they want to do, but they're not allowed to think for themselves. They have to follow what the conductor is saying. Uh, and the, the group playing the conductor uh, gets a lot of interaction on a video conference since they need to decide on a common approach. Um, which industry are we serving first? Uh, which car do we have to pull out again? Uh, does anybody uh, have the paperwork in front of them? By the way, share the paperwork beforehand. Um, PDFs are great for that, or email. Um, so they have to come uh, to, uh, to an agreement on what they want the engineer to do. Uh, then the engineer executes it, and then the group continues uh, the discussion. And we found that uh, this was really, really entertaining um, when, uh, especially for, for people that know each other uh, and you're meeting weekly online and eventually you kind of run out of things to talk about. Um, it very much kept the feeling of uh, uh, a club that belongs together uh, to, to keep that uh, working. So we call that mini ops. Um, we did it on uh, on module sections that I build. We build it, We did it on James's layout. We did it at, uh, uh, at Bill's uh, uh, layout as well. So that was a lot of fun. I was able to sit in on the one that you did at your layout, Bernard, and I thought that was pretty cool because the other thing that I thought was very interesting about that was that each person could have a different idea of how to get this train built, you know, and some of them are not as efficient and that's okay. You still get the job done. And the important thing is that you have fun when you're doing it. Yes. I think that's the biggest, the biggest thing. So, or, or some people make it even more efficient than the uh, layout owner could have thought. Like I ran through mine to make sure that it was possible to even do before the off session. I did it in a certain way because I didn't think that an SD40 uh, tunnel motor would fit in certain areas and they all proved me wrong. Isn't that something? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's, always, that's always a fun part of operations though, mm -hmm. isn't it? Like just kind of pulling that, pulling that train, I think I got enough space, I think I got enough space, and then suddenly you don't, and you know, then you... Yeah. <laughs> and, and meanwhile, the owner is watching you intently. And... <laughs> <laughs> they have to smirk on their face when they do that. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. It's like, yeah, how'd that work out for you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now there are some people locally that have uh, have opted to you know try and you know get some of the uh, some of the railroading software that's out there, some of the train simulators, and sort of do group sessions um, with that kind of thing online. Um, I, I did not because uh, my hardware at the time would not support it, um, but uh, and I think because I because I operate with Mac and you know most of these things are available available for PC that was sort of a hindrance as well um, but that's one way folks have gotten around it but 
one thing I think we really miss as as a as a group of operators is sort of the uh, it's sort of the camaraderie. You know, we'd see each other every week. We'd talk to each other every week and that sort of thing. And you know, we've sort of kept up over with emails over the over the time, but it's you know, it's not the same. So it's not the same, but you're still able to do it. Yeah. I think that does matter. Yeah. I mean, the way I've always thought about it is and this is probably true for most hobbies is that the hobby is really an excuse. Now it could be a cool hobby. Like doing ops is a cool hobby. I think it's fun. I have a lot of fun doing the ops that I've done, but it's really about hanging out with your friends. And I was talking about this on a, on a live call in show that I did recently here on the channel. And I think the comment that I came up with on that was, it's like fishing, you know, you don't go fishing with your friends to catch fish necessarily. Now, if you catch fish and that's what you like to eat fish or whatever, that's a bonus, but you really went there to hang out with your friends and to get outside and do something nice. So it's, I think of it the same way personally. Sure. Uh, someone is asking, Oh, I see. Let me highlight this question here. Uh, this one you guys actually can talk to from Silicon Valley lines. Now, I do want to mention as you're reading that and digesting it, I want to mention that the show that is coming out next Saturday at 9 a.m. Pacific time, it's Model Railroading 101, and it's all about the remote operations that they've developed at Silicon Valley Lines. It's going to answer some of these questions, so we don't have to necessarily go too deep into it because probably most of this is going to be answered. But uh, you guys want to talk about that? Because I know you mentioned on the show, Bernard, about the Vox line and all that. Right. So a couple, couple things uh, with that. So when, when I talked about the camera earlier and feeding it uh, into a browser or into an HTTP stream that a browser can show uh, or that can be sent uh, injected into a video conference, um, I always thought of that as the harder part than doing the actual control. Um, for the control, um, all you need is um, a, an internet router that has the ability to um, accept VPN connections. Um, you can, to, to do it securely, all you need is an internet router that has VPN connect, uh, connectivity. You add your users to that, uh, to that router. Um, you give them the VPN client, and uh, they put it on the device. They call into your router. And at that point, they are on your network. And they just open up Engine Driver or, or Vifrottle, uh, connect to JMRI, and woof, off you go. Easy. Um, if, if you're, uh, and I realize, I'm, I'm talking as an engineer who lives in Silicon Valley. For me, this, this is part of what I do during at, at work. So for me, this is totally normal. Uh, so um, I make this sound a little bit easier than it is, but don't worry, it's not hard. Um, the, other, the other thing uh, uh, people are doing is most routers have the ability to do port forwarding. Um, so you need to know the, the outside IP address um, to give to your operators and then forward a port number to the JMRI server uh, for, uh, for engine drive or, and device throttle. Um, and then they connect to that and take control of engines uh, on a layout. So from a technology perspective, controlling uh, a remote engine um, when you have JMRI um, or similar servers that uh, provide wire throttle uh, service uh, when you have that set up is really easy because all you need to do is provide a network connection from the internet to JMRI. Um, I always thought that it's quite a bit harder to have the video feedback back out to the operators so that they know what they, or that they uh, uh, can see what they're doing. Somebody asked earlier about having the operators there locally to fix derailments and stuff like that. I think I answered it in the in the comments just by typing, but uh, the answer, in case it wasn't clear, is that during the remote operations at Silicon Valley Lines, there are people present at the layout. Yeah. And 
they serve as the local train operators that have a bunch of switching because you can't really switch remotely, you know, unless you're going to have a conductor. There are other issues that that get uh, that pop up when you try to do that that have to do with having too much radio traffic locally. <laughs> we, we kind of talked about that on the Model Railroad in 101 episode too. Yeah. But uh, generally speaking, the locals are run by people on site, and that allows the, the the club members who are there to stay socially distant, which keeps it safer and it also keeps it legal because because where we are, you can't have huge groups of people getting together because uh, if you get mm -hmm. caught, you can get in big trouble for that. Yeah. So I, yeah, it's it's really 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 important for any of what you're talking about here is to to follow the local. Uh, COVID guidelines uh, and yeah. uh, social distancing guidelines, not only because that's what's required of you, um, but also um, it, it's it's a uh, it's a general health thing. Like you don't you don't want to get sick just because you were running model trains. That's that's kind of unf that's that's sad. But right? uh, so if if you cannot make it uh, safe and follow the guidelines, then we shouldn't be doing this. Um, so the guidelines come first. Uh, we have a really large layout room. We routinely host sessions with 15 or more operators um, or people in the layout room, multiple yard masters, uh, assistant yard masters. Uh, we can do two engine crew uh, uh, or two person crews per train and still have space um, in, in the aisles. Like we have four feet wide aisles. Um, but during the remote sessions, we have um, a total of um, five people maximum in the room. Um, and um, most most of those uh, five are actually not interacting with each other at all. Um, they're, they're all distributed around the room and uh, keep their uh, keep their distance. And uh, that's that's really important because we are in uh, indoor room, so um, having that distance, uh, wearing masks, uh, doing the sanitizing, uh, sanitizing, um, and um, um, all the good stuff that uh, we've all learned in the last nine months. <laughs> it's already nine months. Um, all, all the good stuff uh, to to keep this uh, keep this at bay. Um, Years, months, what's the difference at this point? Yeah, but, that's true. <laughs> you know, we, we went into lockdown on March 17th, so it's just a little over six, but boy, does it feel longer. <laughs> you know, I, I, I went out yesterday, one of the very few times that I've gone really out anywhere, but we went out rail fanning with some friends, and we all masked and stayed distant and all that. And I was thinking as we were out there, the last time I was able to get out and do something like that was in January. So we're talking nine months ago. And I thought it felt like it was much longer than that. But I do have to say it was very nice to actually be out doing something for a change after being cooped up here for the past several months. So uh, one thing that, uh, that people are also asking about is what you guys have been doing to take advantage of the extra time that was provided. I know some answers have come through on that, but not from everybody yet. For me, uh, well, the funny thing is usually during the summer, I stop doing a lot of like indoor modeling projects and whatnot because I'm working outside. Uh, that kind of followed the same uh, pattern this year, even with the extra COVID and stuff like that. I find myself reading more of the railroading stuff uh, more so than doing modeling, but I still keep a project going here or there. However, I've basically completely stopped doing my uh, super detailing project for some reason. I just haven't found myself wanting to get back to that is despite all of the extra time. Is the reading, James, you mean for like research for prototypes and that kind of thing? Research, prototypes, uh, reading through the Santa Cruz Mountains, uh, railroad books and all that stuff. Uh, find myself reading a lot more product reviews, stuff like that. Um, and just how to do certain types of modeling so that once I go back into being inside for three, four months because it gets dark at 4 p.m., uh, I'll, ha I'll have a lot more uh, knowledge and skills that I can attempt to work on. 
Yeah. So Some, something that everybody can do a lot more of now is watch TSG multimedia on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to get a shameless plug in somehow. Shameless. Shameless. <laughs> <laughs> Well, like, you know, I, I tell you, I, I've uh, used some of this, uh, uh, some of this uh, COVID time to get the best, uh, the best production of tomatoes uh, that our garden has had, uh, pretty much that I can remember. So, you know, there's there's been other things, uh, other things calling my uh, attention than uh, than model trains and all this too. And you know, some of that some of that lends itself to uh you know doing activities with the kids as well if it's outdoors and doesn't matter if they get overly rambunctious and that kind of thing like they want to do at that at that two and five year old age so right i was going to ask you seth in particular because i know how much you're into ops did you get to do any of these remote ops with anybody around mm -hmm. actually no um you know the silicon valley guys are uh, the people I know the best and, you know, there's a bunch of operators in the club and I think they're all just kind of queued up trying to do their own work at this point. But I'm hopeful that maybe they'll invite me when they've kind of worked through their backlog. <laughs> and, uh, Is that a little hint or what? Yeah. <laughs> uh, realistically, a couple of the, um, you know, ops who have uh, operating hosts who have layouts that are more conducive to keeping some distance or trying to figure out, you know, how we could, uh, you know, do a reduced number of people, low density, um, get a couple of N95 masks. The evidence seems to be that uh, if everybody is N95 and you don't get too close, you're probably fairly safe. Then again, our demographics are not, you know, encouraging. So, if we if we make a mistake, it's very bad. So you know, people are being, you know, very much erring on the side of caution. And uh, uh, you know, so I think it'll be slow. I, I think there probably will be, you know, a slow process of working out of it. You know, with more distance, less touching, uh, lower density. Uh, I, I I sure hope so. Um, hang hang on just one second. I'm, I'm, I'm on this call, honey. <laughs> uh, um, and uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, that's kind of where it is. Uh, you know, there's a number of layouts that have remote dispatching. And uh, the thing is that none of those, you know, have, have come back online because the physical part of the layout is very dense and uh you know they can't get a crew together so there's no point in having a dispatcher you know you brought up something that i think raises an interesting point and i don't know that anybody will have a definite answer to this but because we don't know what's going to happen with the pandemic and all that but thinking in, in terms of the future do you think that any of you guys can answer this. I, I know that at least three of you or two of you are into this LD SIG. Do you think that considerations, you know, not trying to catch other people's viruses or whatever is going to change the outlook on layout design for the future at all? Well, or the problem I think is that, you know, everybody expects using, say, uh, 1918 as a precedent is in. You know, two or three years, the pandemic will have pretty much gone away. Uh, but the half-life of a layout's more like 10 or 15. So, and the constraints are always there. Now, what I do think is a little bit of a trend is more aisle space, because as we have grown old, we have grown out, and more aisle space is necessary anyhow. And that's probably conducive to a little more social distance. So I think that'll fall out. But um, nobody except Stephen Priest builds a layout quick enough to say, oh, gee whiz, density is a real problem. Better make a more uh, uh, socially distant layout um, and get it online before the thing is a distant memory. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of doubt it. I think where yeah. this is a possibility very much is modular setups. Yeah. Um, you um, you use the same number of modules, but you go into a larger uh, um, uh, into a larger setting, or you use the same like 
whether that's that's a that's a school gym or or whatever um and normally for for the modular setups you try to pack in as many modules as you can and uh and operate with as many people as you can have but in uh at the moment um it's much more about okay what is how how can we arrange uh, the module uh, the modular setup so that it's still conducive to operations, um, but do it with fewer people, fewer modules, uh, in a larger space so that uh, we can keep the distance um, for for everyone involved. And uh, I think for modular setups, that that is totally feasible since they're flexible. Yeah, yeah, especially Fremo. Yeah, and and I can see that happening too. If people would have, had, you know, if this uh, time gave people a little bit more time to build up their bigger modules, I mean, that would make, or you know, or build a couple modules. I mean, that would sort of make the uh, Fremo layouts uh, naturally uh, larger. But I don't, I don't necessarily see a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of layout design adjustments that are, that would be COVID. 19, 19 specific because this thing this thing has come and it's with us now and it's it's a pain in the rear uh, but it'll go away again just like uh, just like these things always do and and so I yeah I don't think I don't think people will necessarily be thinking about that as much as what space they have available in their basement or what space they have available in their rooms. I think that it'll change people more than layouts specifically because mm -hmm. uh, I think now we're going to start seeing people who are a lot less uh, willing to go out when they have a cold or something like that. It's kind of brought a lot of that uh, uh, self-governance into it, or not, that's not the word I want, but uh, it's made people a lot more aware of just how they can spread things because... You know, you think of colds and whatnot, if you give it to somebody, it's not a big deal, but now you've got all these things that you can kill people with if you spread around. Um, and remote ops kind of breaks into that. We're not planning to stop that once um, once this COVID thing goes away. We'll have it available for people who either can't make it there because they just got home from work or they've got to take care of their kids, stuff like that. So yeah, you know, it's I think the biggest thing is people are going to change. It's interesting you bring that up, uh, James, because one of the closing comments that I make on the Model Railroading 101 episode that's coming up next week is that remote ops are not just for pandemics. You could be physically limited. You know, you could just be too far away. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe someone's in a wheelchair and the club is downstairs and they can't get to it. Yeah. And they could still have fun, right? I mean, you don't have mm -hmm. to. I mean, I, I mean, there's a guy that I know from a, a semi-local club here who has trouble because he's a very advanced uh, diabetic and has problems with his feet and stuff like that. And it's a very difficult thing to get into the club where he would normally operate. So he doesn't go as often. But if they had remote ops, he can still enjoy operating that way. And I think that's a, a good point that you bring up. So thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, yeah, and then uh, you know, there's also the you know, people who you'd like to operate with, but they live on an island in the North Sea, or they uh, live in New South Wales, and uh, it's just tough to get on a plane and come down to San Jose to run. I just thought of something else, Seth. It could be someone that you don't want to have come to your layout, so you tell them to do it remotely, and then have a problem with the computer that day. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Right? <laughs> I don't know what's wrong. My internet's just not working today. <laughs> Got some technical issues here. Darn it. Yeah, but it's too late because, you know, they're too far away. And by the time you can come over, but we'll be done by the time you get here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be careful about the next planned one. It's the No Homers Model Railroad Club. <laughs> You know, whatever works, I guess. No, all kidding aside, because we don't want to exclude people. We want to bring, make it as big of a tent as possible. <laughs> but, but I mean, they, they, the people that uh, have bad hygiene could do it remotely. That would work. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So we're still we're still having some uh, people in the side conversation on our on our text chat here. So 
this is a good time if anybody wants to ask more questions. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of a question to throw out there, but after my uh, stupid jokes, I'm not sure if I can come up with one. <laughs> so, so you you mentioned uh, I think uh, James mentioned uh, research earlier as well. Um, I'm building a a modular modular extension for uh, this layout, um, which is the thing that uh, I, I plan to take a, to a show in July. Um, and that extension, or at least one station on that, is modeled after uh, a terminal station uh, on a small branch line uh, in southwestern Germany. Um, so early on uh, during the pandemic, I actually spent a lot of time on um, prototype research, uh, digging through uh, Google Maps and uh, satellite views to figure out what exactly the arrangement of the tracks used to be, uh, what exactly the um, the station building looks like. And uh, there, there are lots and lots of really cool websites out there uh, that uh, trace uh, abandoned rails um, that uh, show the, the um, the, the railroad buildings that are still there, uh, photos of that. So um, even if you cannot travel right now, um, you can still do prototype research um, with uh, visiting websites. And uh, one thing I did is uh, I from, I'm not sure if this is coming across on a video, but um, I built this mock-up of, uh, of the station building of that branch um, just from photos. Um, it's a little bit bland on one side, and it's really pretty half-timbered wood uh, on, on the other side. So once that's done, I'm going to scratch build that um, maybe one of those long uh, winter evenings uh, that uh, are upon us uh, at some point. Um, it should look really cool when, when it's done. And this is uh, just out, out there um, from, from photos and, and I, I, I bring this in on, on my modules, and uh, that re actually really makes me happy. Since I can still do something, and I can do the research, um, I, I did the, the, uh, um, the, the roof shape research directly off Google Maps, off, off the satellite views. Um, I, didn't, I didn't actually expect that I would be able to do it, but hey, that worked great. <laughs> That's awesome. Someone uh, suggested, or someone actually commented, I guess Andy Ambrose had a look at the uh, SVL website where you guys have published all the details in the code, which is something else I mentioned on the on the uh, MR101 video. Sorry, I didn't mean to change subjects on you, but that came in as a comment, and I thought that was a, a nice comment. And yeah, we should probably, thank you, Andy. Yeah, we should probably mention that, that uh, all the code and all that stuff is on the SVL website, as well as pretty detailed or I should say details about the uh, operations and the cars and everything else that these guys built. Uh, it's pretty remarkable. And I'm really glad James B that you were here because I know that you designed one of the original ones, didn't you? Yeah, I kind of came up with that. A lot of late nights of uh, frustration with trying to figure out how to do it with Google live and, or YouTube live and all of that and keeping the bandwidth down and the delay down. And finally we abandoned that and went for the simplest route of a program that basically just takes a bunch of pictures and stitches them all together. It, uh, it ended up coming out a lot better than I thought it would. Once I hit that point of very little delay, it was just kind of like Eureka, this was something that will actually work for us. Uh, and on that note of there being stuff up on our website, there will be more later on we kind of hit a point where I had to stop working on it for a little bit, um, but we're going to start writing a whole lot more stuff on there on how to put up uh, the OBS or the Open Broadcast Streamer or whatever it is. I can't remember what the acronym stands for. Uh, we're going to put up that and a couple of other things on there, I think, at some point. I'm going to dabble a little bit in trying to figure out how to do the track power thing. Even if we don't end up using it for uh, SVL, we can put it out there on how to do it. I've got a whole bunch of stuff at home to mess with, and uh, once I can get back there, I'll start doing so, and we'll get up more content. I have, I have a question that might be a dumb question, and that is, you know how people use capacitors, like a Keep Alive 
circuit mm -hmm. to keep your decoders running. Couldn't something like that be used for a camera as well? I mean, or is conditioning that that was you guys were? I think Bernard was talking about conditioning the power source. Is that different from what capacitors do? Or if I'm just no, it's it's pretty much a, it's a very similar thing. Uh, the the difference is that um, if if you cut out the power to a decoder and then you put power back, um, the decoder comes back alive within a couple of seconds. Um, it's like uh, when, when when a locomotive uh, uh, finally uh, hits hits a dead spot and the uh, sound goes away. It's like ah crap. Okay, fine, dead spot. So you move locomotive forward. One, two, sound is back. Locomotive is moving. Um, the uh, software system like the Raspberry Pi, um, it actually takes a minute to to boot the darn thing. Okay. So, so every time you lose the power, um, you're sitting there for a while. When right. I the stuff you have to yeah. um, also take some care in a Linux system like a Raspberry Pi to shut it down in a reasonably orderly way. So that requires some extra hardware to make sure it does it. Once it's done, you've really got to run its course and let it shut down fully and restart fully. So it's considerably more complicated than restarting a decoder. Well, and, and the other thing I've noticed too, um, like even with the Keep Alive, um, is that uh, is that some of the lighting features that I've done with uh, the Atmel Tiny 13 chips, um, which is in that uh, rotary beacon, it doesn't respond well and play nicely with the Keep Alive because the Keep Alive is giving it slightly less voltage than it would be receiving otherwise. Uh, otherwise, if it were proper track voltage, so you would need you would need something a bit stronger than that Keep Alive. You know, maybe maybe a smaller uh, a smaller battery you know that would be constantly charged if you could seamlessly go between charging mode and and run mode um on that battery uh but the keep alive is unfortunately not a not a great answer for that application i guess that the raspberry pi would have similar sensitivities yeah that's why we're using the juice box zero for this yeah, yeah exactly i mean you can you can certainly work around that with some circuitry to uh, you know, buck boost circuitry to make sure the crawl is getting the right voltage, but you're adding a lot of circuitry. Uh, there's not much room in there. Right. And you're losing some power in, in all that conversion. I mean, it's, it's pretty good as converters go, but, you know, we're starting to get a fairly complex circuit in there to make sure that the voltage is constant and deal with shutting down when we have to and restarting. And, uh, you know, it's getting to be a bit of a production. Yeah, no, I guess that I guess that really just exposes my ignorance on that topic because I haven't messed with capacitors or all this raspberry stuff. To me, a raspberry pie is something you eat. So, <laughs> so uh, more uh, more so on the remote ops and all that stuff. This stuff is all open source, and if you want to mess around with it and you want to make changes or you want to try and make it better, go right ahead. Uh, that's why we put up the instructional walkthrough that way. So you can see what you're putting together and you can try and make it better. Maybe you'll find something that I overlooked. This isn't my, uh, this isn't my main thing. I do a lot of IT stuff, but working with Linux and all that stuff isn't what I normally do. So this is definitely a hobby grade thing for me. Uh, so yeah, I definitely encourage you to try and mess around with that, make changes, break it. You probably won't actually burn anything out if you're not playing with the uh, circuitry on the Pi itself. But uh, even if you are, I mean, they're, they're pretty cheap. If you've got, you know, 30 bucks to burn, you could try all kinds of crazy things. I definitely plan to here soon, uh, just in the name of science and model railroading. <laughs> Your dedication is admirable, James. It's a lot cheaper than burning out a decoder. Oh, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's interesting too because and I, I like the the attitude that you take of of you know, try it and see what you come up with because it's possible someone will come up and it's like, Well, I didn't even think about that. Why didn't I think of that? So, you know, something so simple that could improve things vast, you know, tremendously. Mm -hmm. you, you never know until you get a lot of minds working on something sometimes, right? So somebody had a question that I highlighted on here. 
it's kind of unrelated to what we were just talking about. We're kind of jumping around a little bit because the questions that come in from the viewers are a little bit random. But they're asking about the length of the trains that are being run at Silicon Valley Lines and if that's any different from how it was before the pandemic. It's, it's not any different, actually. Uh, the, the way we do it is uh, our train master is preparing the sessions like normal. Uh, and so all the trains are staged uh, with, with the cars that are supposed to be on them. Um, and we only run the, uh, the, the trains that are the through trains uh, or uh, come from staging, uh, stop in the yard and go to staging. Um, only those trains are run remotely. Um, so for a remote operator, they don't care how long the train is. Um, it just, it could be, there could be no car behind them because they actually have no idea. I was going to tell you to try that sometime. Just let them run a locomotive over the layout. Yep, yep. And, and uh, I, I did that uh, one, one day when I was testing uh, the camera cars. Um, I, I just had a bunch of locomotives move around and um, what do you need to train for? Um, so for, for the fruit trains, it doesn't really matter uh, uh, for, from the remote operations perspective. And uh, so they are just the same length as, as always. Um, and the, the local switch jobs are operated by someone in the layout room. So it's not any different for them as well. You could have a really virtual op session if, if the person on the other end of the, the line it's just telling you, okay, I cut the car off. Meanwhile, they're over here drinking a beer or something. <laughs> <laughs> Go yep. ahead, move forward now. <laughs> It'll be fine. What's the worst that could happen? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Two cars, one car, half a car, that'll do. <laughs> Bang! <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway uh yeah we saw that in kansas city on wednesday didn't we um, oh the bridge yeah <laughs> oh yeah didn't they fall asleep somehow at, at the wheel or or at the throttle oh well, did he? I, I, I think that's that's what i heard happen like uh that the uh that the internal camera on the locomotive caught the crew asleep wow really yeah well i bet they woke up when it derailed on the bridge Oh, I, I would imagine, and I, I'd, I'd guess they'd have had to get new trousers. That's yeah, that would have been scary. <laughs> I mean, there they were right up above the Missouri River. That's a a, fall, a long drop. Yeah. <laughs> it's well, like when you play that joke on somebody who's in the passenger seat of your car who's asleep. You're swerving all over the place, except for this one was real. Yeah, right. Imagine the dreams the guy was having right before he woke up. <laughs> <laughs> Three days off, pee in a cup. <laughs> that was definitely a pee in the cup episode, wasn't it? Yeah. All right. uh, so <laughs> someone is asking a question. I don't know if you guys want to. It's really unrelated to, to what we're talking about, but I thought it was kind of an interesting question. And it's more of a layout building question. Are you guys okay with taking one of those real quick sure. i think you've all worked on building layouts uh somebody is asking let me find it real quick up here uh what the order is i can't find it now oh here it is they wanted to know if uh now i lost it again they oh, wanted to know, know about the track scenery ballast yes uh, it was that one thanks seth yeah um you know i think I don't know that you need to wait six months. So, you know, if, if the lumber is reasonably seasoned, that shouldn't be necessary. Although you definitely should run it a few times before you ballast. But, um, uh, you know, the order conventionally is uh, track, ballast, scenery. Although I have to say, I've seen a number of layouts where people have done at least basic scenery around the track before they ballast. Because in the real world, you know, the ground is there before the red right. goes in. And, it, you know, it probably makes it a little easier to have a realistic um, transition. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, wh whatever works for you, try a few feet and see what works. And uh, uh, then do it. You'll work out a technique that's fine. There, there's no one way. Yeah. And I know, I know also that some people 
we'll build a, a layout that's just track for operations and simulated, you know, industries or whatever, and not even scenic it. You could just oh. have mockups. You could have just have mockups like uh, Bernard's building that he was showing, serving as your structures. If all you really want to do is operate on it, right? I mean, well, I think mockups with names on it certainly gives you your operators the cues they need. There's a famous, well-known uh, operating layout that is considered to be one of the great operating layouts in the Kansas City area that uh, has never been scenic, and the owner doesn't seem to have any interest at all in doing anything about it. And uh, He's sort of the butt of jokes about it. Uh, there's lots of railroads that have unscenic areas where there's a little sign at the beginning of it saying, this owner's name, National Forest, you know, because there's no trees. Uh, <laughs> Just use your imagination. Well, he's a friend of mine. I don't want to call him out right. and insult him, but uh, we do have some fun at his expense with that. Well, uh, I know that I know that uh, some friends of mine uh, they have a they have a wonderfully operating layout, and they've been they've. Uh, Let's let the uh, scenery aspect of it really take the back burner, because they've been protecting, perfecting their uh, track work, and their and the operations aspect. Make sure that everything runs flawlessly, uh, no derail derailments, and all that sort of stuff. And one of the things that they've been discovering on the way is that some of the better scenic layouts, um, they become or. Some of the uh, some of the added scenery becomes a little bit of a hindrance for the operations, because now you're worrying about busting a tree or you're or uh, you know knocking something over with that giant uh, crane from the sky as you're trying to un uncouple your cars and that kind of thing. Whereas before, if there wasn't really anything in the way, um, you wouldn't have to worry about breaking anything. Um, and, and then there's also the tendency of everyone in the operating room to want to lean on the layout. And if you have scenery there, that becomes an issue as well. That, that, uh, so there's, there's a whole lot of factors that have gone into consideration. Though I do know that, that these guys in the, uh, in the wake of COVID and some of the extra time that they've had when they've been unable to operate, um, they've actually started to do, to do some scenery, scenery for it. And it's actually pretty stunning what they've, what they've come up with. Yeah, I, I think James raises a really interesting question there. Uh, you know, one of the reasons to do mock-ups like Bernard was doing is that you can lay out your industrial area and then you can get a good idea of what the sight lines and reach lines, in particular the reach lines people don't think about. And like you say, you know, you hit the bridge, you hit the detailed building, you knock over the trees. So you really have to run a few sessions and work through uh, how the session is, is, is going to operate uh, to be able to, you know, get those uh, particularly switching areas uh, done if you're going to scenic them properly. And, uh, uh, you know, it's something uh, we learned the hard way here. And, uh, uh, you know, and I, I don't think there's a perfect answer. You just have to go try it because you as the owner have a particular vision for how that job is supposed to be done. But, uh, you know, even one of your regular guys will have a completely different take on it. And you need to understand that. Right. So uh, normally, guys, what would end up happening is around this time during this procedure, there would be a knock on the depot door and the food would have arrived. <laughs> <laughs> so... We don't have we have virtual food here because we're doing this oh. virtually. What? So, no pizza? Sorry, You're, I know man, this is a ripoff, man. I know, right? <laughs> I, I was waiting till the end though to tell you, Seth, because I didn't want you to show you know not show up. I, I, I thought you were sending beer. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the beer is in the mail with the check. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's how that works. So uh uh, someone is. Uh, I want to take one more question here. Uh, I, I don't know that you guys will know because I don't know if you have have a lot of experience with this. But somebody is asking. Oh, and then after that, we'll kind of wrap things up. So think of if you have something that you want to say in closing uh, before we wrap things up here. But uh, one of our viewers, Andy, is asking about switching with the MTH couplers that do the uh, remote uncoupling. Do you know? Do you know what he's talking about? And 
if you think that's feasible, I guess with our with the uh, remote ops uh, operations that we've been talking about. You know, it works well on the locomotive, but usually when you're switching, you're working at the end of a cut of cars, so it's pretty hard. Now, we did have a guy here, Kermit Paul, who sadly passed away a couple of years ago because he was a wonderful guy and very innovative. And he had a 130 sec, 1 to 32 garden railroad where you'd point a laser at the coupler and that would... Uh, you know, trigger a sensor and fire off a little solenoid. And that worked really, really well, even in bright sunlight. And that was brilliant. But you can't really sit there, you know, and dial up freight car numbers on the cab. It's just too bulky. Um, and you're generally not switching at the car itself, except for some passenger operations and helpers. So I think by all means, if you're modeling horseshoe curve, and you've got your Pensy snapper and you want to cut off on the fly, it couldn't be cooler. But, you know, as a practical matter for industrial switching, not so much. Yeah, I don't know enough about it, so that makes sense to me. Yeah, I, I agree. The, um, the, couple, the, the remote controlled couplers are really, really cool um, at the locomotive. Um, but the, the other thing is people uh, put uh, magnet uncouplers into their track and uh, you just move over and then you move back and it's uncoupled, yay. Um, you can do that remotely, kind of, if you have an idea where you are. But right. the thing is that when you are controlling only the locomotive and you have the view of the engineer and if you've ever been in an engine, and you look down a train, you have no idea how far away uh, from a specific point the car is that, that you're currently switching. You completely rely on your conductor. Um, and, and they tell you, OK, now, it, now it's good. Stop here. Um, so how long, how long do you guess it is before, before we have little uh, 187th androids that can perfectly <laughs> walk the train you know, and, and cut it, you know. Well, I, I have a friend who's got a layout like that, but they're all like eight-legged. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Someone needs to do a little dusting, huh? <laughs> yes. I think I, I think I know what you're talking about, Seth. I'll ask you later. <laughs> oh, man. So does anybody else have anything else to uh, to mention about you know taking taking the hobby through the pandemic and maybe some ideas that you guys should leave our viewers to uh you know because a lot of people i think are like oh my god the world is ending i can't do my train stuff uh as far as getting out to do it uh, you know my thought is maybe just take the time to work on something at home whether it be research or you know building on the model or adding DCC to a model or whatever. Uh, what do you guys think? And then we'll wrap things. Yeah, my, my take my take on this is the, the pandemic is going to end. Um, we will get to a point where we go back to some form of normal. We don't know yet what that no, new normal is going to look like, but whatever. Um, the restrictions that we have right now are going to end. And if they're not going to end, we will adjust to that. So I have very high faith in, in humans to do the right thing over time. So um, right now, hunker down, uh, prepare for that time when uh, we can go out again and meet friends and have social interactions uh, uh, without uh, uh, fear that uh, uh, someone's getting get, uh, going to get killed along the way. Um, and so, so that time will come. Um, do, do your stuff, uh, uh, build that car, uh, finish your layout, finish your modules, uh, and um, get be ready to get together with friends. Any, anybody else? That was great. I couldn't have said that better. Except I don't know about having faith in people doing the right thing. I guess we'll have to wait and see about that. Dude, I, I'm, I'm an optimist. I'm, I always think about VR. We are going to do the right thing eventually. Right. Yeah, I, I, th I think we'll have solutions to this over time. Uh, 
I personally have uh, just been, you know, funny thing about being a layout owner, I, I show my layout and there's this wonderful structure that somebody else built and this fantastic little piece of rolling stock that somebody else built or kit bashed or whatever. And, you know, to keep things moving and to kind of keep my round robin guys happy, I end up doing either stuff that nobody else wants to do or things that you kind of have to do, you know, on 12 hour clocks because stuff needs to dry. And, you know, they only come over once a week uh, when, when they could come over. So I've had a pile of little projects pile up, just a little detail this or finish that, that, um, you know, I never could do on Monday night because, you know, somebody else needed to work bench, somebody else needed to paint, somebody else was standing in the way of where I needed to work. And, uh, you know, I in cleaning up, I've found, you know, easily a dozen projects, you know, ranging from trivial to, you know, buildings that need some serious work that have been in that category. So I've been, you know, trying to roll those up. And uh, what's kind of nice is I think when we can start to work together again, uh, things will go pretty fast because a whole lot of dumb little things are, you know, out of the way now. And or at least there's a plan. So, you know, I certainly, you know, if you're optimistic about uh, vaccines being available and people's willingness to use them and uh, make the world a safer place. I, I think by the time we get back to normal, it won't be too horribly far out and uh, I'll have made some progress in the meantime. Excellent. Either James? Not at All the right. same time. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, as Bernard says, Seth says, this will pass. Uh, some of the things will stick around with us for quite some time. Hopefully some of them stick around for a long time. Uh, at least while this is still a moving memory of dealing with like what to do when you're sick, not going around people. But also now we have ways of uh, bringing people in who are sick and can't go out because they're immunocompromised, etc. cetera. Uh, I think that technology is going to start to adapt real quick here. It's kind of start uh, as we've all seen. This is going on a lot longer than we thought when we first initially went into the shelter in place in Marchish. Um, technology is going to start to advance and pick up a lot of the slack on this uh, remote stuff, and I think we're going to start seeing a lot more of that. Manufacturers will probably start jumping in on this eventually even if they're waiting it out to see, hopefully they kind of realize that, yeah, this is a good thing. Somebody who's got the flu might want to stay home or they can't make it somewhere because this, that, or the other, they can do, still do remote ops. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that there are a couple of products out there available commercially, but they're either old or not really tailored to what we're currently doing, either as a hobby or a society. You know, one of the things that I that I hope kind of lasts uh, coming out of this, I, I don't, you know, I I guess I'm a little bit less optimistic about our ability to get things right. Um, I mean, I guess I guess in Missouri, you know, we're we're very much in the red zone here. Um, yes, as soon as you get outside the outside the county lines, especially, um, it it seems like. Uh, the desire and willingness to, to handle things reasonably just kind of diminishes. But we will eventually be through it one way or the other. These things, th these things don't, don't last forever, no, no matter how badly we handle it. And I'm sure that eventually we will run out of, run out of wrong ways to handle things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, all that serious... All that seriousness aside, one thing I, I do hope sort of comes out of this is, uh, or that uh, continues, is that uh, is that we will see see a continued resurgence in the uh, model road and hobby, and sort of the interest in that, um, because I know that across the board, uh, even though the local hobby shops have had challenges. Um, in general, there has been a real resurgence of interest in, in these kinds of things, that people have been going back to their layouts. Um, they've been 
they've been expanding their locomotive fleets. They've been taking on these projects. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, uh, I guess that's kind of a silver lining, you know, that, that, that certain things that we enjoy about life are, are able to make a resurgence. Um, you know, soundtracks of course has had the slogan, uh, stay calm and play with trains. Um, which, which I think is what a lot of us are basically doing. I mean, there's there's been the common joke that uh, that sort of the social isolation is the thing that model railroaders have been training for our entire lives. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I, I just hope I just hope that uh, I just hope that some of the enjoyment of the hobby continues after that. Um, yeah, I think it's inevitable that the enjoyment of hobbies will always continue as long as we have time for hobbies. So. Right. Anyway, I want to thank you guys uh, for taking the time to do this and thank the audience for taking the time to watch. And just know that everybody here on the call or meeting, whatever you want to call this, is going to be on Jeopardy someday as an answer to the first ever virtual TSG train crew hang or a train <laughs> crew lounge <laughs> and um, yeah I think it was really great and I uh, appreciate you guys uh, taking the time also want to thank our moderators too that uh, helped the conversation stay straight I, I don't know who all was in there because on my stream yard I don't see the little wrenches that tell, tell us who the moderators are so anyway uh, thank you guys and I'm gonna let this, gonna let this run for about 20 or 30 seconds and it will then evaporate. So thanks. All right. Thanks, John. Thank, Thank you, John. You Thanks. Good, good talk.